Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Philip Hussheider, and he is a farmer who's had a near-death experience. And I find this so interesting because I think uh, what we think of farmers is is not in the supernatural realm of things. Do you th think it was like that for you before, Philip? I would I would say yes. <clears throat> Um, prior to mine, I, I knew or I had heard about NDEs, but I never explored them. I never read any of them and uh, never really took an in-depth look at it. Uh, I, I had my own ideas of what uh, an afterlife might be, and I just went with that. Um, it wasn't something I thought a great deal about on a day-to-day -day basis in a farm. Uh, one is usually confronted with some sort of demise of animals and you, not that you get used to it, but you understand that there is a finality to it. Uh, I knew there was a finality to this life prior to my NDE, uh, but I did not understand exactly what it was afterwards that I would experience until it actually happened. And one of the things, I, I wouldn't recommend an NDE to anybody. However, I'm, I'm grateful for having experienced it because it's given me a whole different uh, outlook on life. And not only this life, but the afterlife. And uh, there are a lot of skeptics and everyone's welcome to their own opinion. But in the end, we all find out what that afterlife will be because it's uh, eternal. Um, when th this doesn't really relate exactly to my collapse, but it is one of the realizations I came to uh, in trying to understand what happened to me at the time it did, where it did, and the big question of why. I hope you mentioned, like you did in your book, the cows, how they responded to you that morning, just before this oh. happened. I find that really interesting. Like um, maybe you have a keen sense or something that we're not aware of. Well, I think, I think animals do. I think, uh, I, I can't explain it, but I've, I've seen enough animals uh, in my lifetime and worked with enough to know that uh, they perceive things, maybe not in the way that we understand that perception, but they do perceive things that is beyond what we want to acknowledge most days. Um, when, I was, when I was out in the pasture and we pasture graze beef cattle, uh, when I was out in the pasture that morning, uh, you know, I had absolutely no idea that an hour later I would become an expert on dying. Uh, it wasn't within my imagination. But I did walk out there, and normally I can, we had 28, 28 head of beef cattle out in our 58-acre uh, pasture. And normally when I went out there, I could get amongst them. Uh, we tried to keep them calm when you work with them every day, they, they get used to you. Normally I could just get up and walk amongst them, pat them on the head or on the rump, uh, scratch them a little bit, and they wouldn't uh, bother me. They just keep, keep eating grass. That morning I got within 300 yards of the group. They were out in the middle of the pasture. And one of them raised her head up, ears pricked towards me, and all of a sudden took off like a jet. Uh, raced across the field, went about six, 800 yards, and stopped, turned around and looked at me. Well, this caused a little commotion <laughs> with, the rest of the, with the rest of the herd. And they all looked up, ears perked towards me, trying to see what that one had been looking out. And then they all took off, running full speed until they reached her. And then they stopped and they all turned and looked at me. Uh, 
And I thought, well, this is really unusual because it had never happened before. But I didn't think anything of it. And so I walked back into the barn or back, back out of the field towards the barn. And I went into the house and I changed my clothes and I went into uh, our local town and went to the local hospital's fitness area, uh, which was in a separate building, which I had been going to for the previous eight months. And uh, changed my clothes, walked upstairs and started my exercise. And it was at that point, which was about an hour after I had been out in the pasture, I stood up from the arm curl machine. I wasn't even exercising. And both of my forearms uh, started tingling, uh, like when you lie on your arm and you wake up and then it starts, the blood comes rushing back in and it tingles until it feels normal again. Well, both of them did. And I remember looking down at my arms and that was the last thing I remembered for eight hours. And it was during that time that uh, I went through a uh, resuscitation period with the staff. And then the ambulance team arrived and it took them in the medical reports later that I, I looked at, it took six minutes, a little over six minutes to get my heart restarted. And I was told by some doctors that I was really lucky because a few more seconds and it gets to the far edge of where the electrical nodes uh, exchange uh, their signals and completely cease. And once that happens, you can't restart the heart. Uh, some people I was told don't make it three minutes. So I got very fortunate for the second time, first because I was in a place where I could get help. I wasn't out in the middle of our pasture where there was no one other than the cattle. Um, and I was uh, in, in a place where they could get me, get me help right away. So yeah, I was fortunate. And that became, that became the driving force after, during my recovery. And uh, well, spoiler alert, I did did survive it because I am here. <laughs> but um, it took them two, possibly three electrical shocks to just re restart my heart. And that's that's all I I described that in the book. It's not that I understood what was happening at that time because I, I wasn't here. Um, but. I interviewed the people who were intimately involved with my rescue and to get their perspective of what happened in the timeline and that sort of thing, which was really interesting. And, and I'll come back to what I, I mentioned before in, in just a bit, but that, was, that portion was really interesting because each of those EMTs, uh, there were 11 of them that ended up working on me in some form. Uh, and the, the four uh, people who managed or oversaw the, the hospital's fitness area, each one of them knew exactly, could remember exactly what they did during the time they were working on me. They did, couldn't remember the uh, person next to them or across from them, but they could remember exactly what they were doing. So by interviewing all of them, I was able to piece together uh, this scene that I describe in my book and also the timeline that it took. And so that, that, part, that portion was, was really important to me to understand. Um, I could, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was an eight hour gap where I went through the rescue. I was taken by an ambulance to a Madison hospital. Uh, they said I was awake the whole time answering questions, but I, I recall none of that. Uh, it wasn't until eight hours later, which would have been roughly seven o'clock at night, when I finally 
well, the best way I can explain it, fate phase back in uh, and could start seeing people and realizing I was talking with someone or someone was talking to me. It took that long, but it, uh, and from there it, it went on to uh, a stay of three days in the hospital, which they thought, thought was really unusual because no one ever thought I looked like I had basically dropped dead. Uh, my blood pressure was normal. My color was good. Now this was after they got my heart started again. But it was during those six minutes when I had my, well, other dimensional experience. And uh, that in itself was something that took me a long time to understand. Now, was this a heart attack? No, they, they, uh, the doctors referred to it as a sudden cardiac death. Okay. Uh, there was no, the, my heart just stopped. Well, it, apparently it, it wobbled because it got out of balance. And that was because there wasn't enough blood supply going through one of the arteries. There was enough to keep me alive without having a, what they call a full blown heart attack, which they said I probably wouldn't have survived if that had happened. But there was enough of a little thread uh, through the artery blockage that allowed blood to flow. And that allowed, uh, the ability to restart the heart, even though it had stopped. But because for some reason, uh, even though I wasn't actually doing a physical exercise, I was just standing next to the machine. For some reason, that was enough to trigger uh, an imbalance in the heart rhythm and really kind of like knocked it off balance. It, it's like when you have a top spinning and then it starts to slowly stop and it wobbles and then it goes off off to the side because i think in your book you just did like 20 arm curls like you just got yeah, there yeah it wasn't yeah it wasn't much of it at all now <clears throat> the question i the first question as as i after i got home and got through started my recovery the first question to myself was okay why did it happen there and not an hour earlier i mean i wasn't really i wasn't running out in the pasture either i was just walking Nothing happened out there except cattle looking a little spooked, like they had seen a ghost. And, you know, coming back to that, that's, you know, maybe what they saw, some aura that did not align with what they had been used to. I wondered that. And I wondered, too, like maybe a guardian angel was there with you that they saw. Well, I believe in. I believe in guides, guardian agents, whatever you want to refer to them, because I had seen them and I had witnessed them. And they acknowledged their presence to me about six months later. So, yeah, I know they're there, which was uh, an interesting part of my thought process because I realized, uh, I should say I had to go through, uh, you know, six, eight months of basically mental recovery to get myself to be able to think, remember stuff. Um, as my brain became more functional again, and the doctor said that would be part of the recovery process. I think we're in a state of shock for a while too, when we come close with death. Well, I think the whole body is because mm -hmm. it's such an unnatural thing for it to do is not function. Uh, fortunately for me, there was uh, the CPR was able to keep enough oxygen in my body to keep my brain cells functioning. Uh, lying unattended for three minutes, you have about three minutes worth of oxygen in your blood system uh, without any intervention because they were able to start it basically immediately because uh, I, I talk about in the book when Diane, who was one of the uh, Wellspring Center people in the room, uh, dropped her clipboard and it started CPR right away. I mean, she's like, she said she was like three feet away from me. So I was not without oxygen for 
that three minutes, which could have been a whole different scenario. So I, <laughs> the whole crux of this is that I learned more about the medical aspects of what happens to you than I thought I ever wanted to know. But, yeah, what a uh, perfect place to be for this to happen. Of all the places you could have been at that time. Oh, exactly. You, you've hit it on the head. And that was one of the things that I struggled with, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to understand. Why did it happen there with that many people around, with that much help, and not somewhere else? I mean, it was a big why question. And the more I started remembering uh, what had happened, and the more I recalled what was going on in the, the other dimension I was in, the more I was getting answers as to why that was. And uh, as, and I, I can jump forward because this is a, a, a thing that happened uh, about six, seven months later when I sat up in bed and my wife, Mary, wrote down what I was saying and I went right back to sleep. And the next morning she asked if I knew what I had said and I said I didn't even know I was awake. She said, well, you really weren't, but you were talking, so I wrote it down. And she said, uh, I, she said, what I had told her or spoke out was that I was to be a conduit for people who were afraid of what came next. And this was a you know, long time after I had had my uh, experience in another dimension. So that, it's not that I'm on a mission, but it's a one of the driving forces for me to write the book so that people could read my perspective, come to their own conclusions, because I'm not going to tell them what to think. But I lay out what I experienced and how it's changed me, and they can do with it as they wish. So the... whole study or my my looking at why you know came came in different uh points it, it wasn't the, this printout of well this is this is your whole story it came in bits and pieces and so during the next year i, I started taking notes uh when i thought of something or recalled something and that's what my came it, too Sorry? My, my second into E, that's the way it came to, bits and pieces. Yeah, I don't think we're given it to you all at once. And I, I talk about this in, in my book that my thought is I was given enough, and this is what I really believe, I was given enough information in that dimension that I could safely bring back to this one without frying my brain because that dimension is all knowledge. And if I brought, <clears throat> and I'm sure I experienced more than I've been able to recall so far. I think I was only given enough that I could safely bring back without my, my brain going crazy. And I liken it to a computer memory. Like say you have a, a computer with eight, eight gigabytes of memory. Okay, and, and now all of a sudden, in an instant, you're trying to cram 150,000 gigabytes into that eight gigabyte memory. Well, what's gonna happen? It's probably gonna crash it. Well, that's probably what's happened to me. At least that's what I think happened. I mean, do I, I have proof of that? No, yeah. it just. I, I think remembering is very different than comprehending too. I mean, we can remember bits and pieces, but then to comprehend is like decades, like the rest of our life to try to comprehend mm -hmm. something like I, that. I, I agree. I agree. It, it's a different uh, way of coming to the information. You know, you, you experience it, which is one form of information. You think about it and comprehend. That's another form of information so yeah there are different there are different aspects to it and i don't think 
it's a one size fits all because I think there are similarities in NDEs. But I also, also think that there are uniqueness points to each person, which, which makes sense because we're all different. Even yeah. though, go ahead. Even like you saying that you're to be a conduit for people that are afraid about what happens next, even that is like, okay, I guess I'm comprehend that. I gotta stop and think about that because it makes so much sense that we're not sent back so we can just say heaven's real, angels real, Jesus real, you know, whatever those things, any of our religious things or people that want to use it and say the opposite. Um, it is not like done for selfish reasons from heaven, if that makes sense, but it is for us to lessen the fear on earth of death. Well, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, we as humans are structured and have been taught that we should be afraid of death. It's the last thing we should do. Uh, well, it is the last thing that we do, <laughs> literally, but um, to be avoided at all costs. Well, okay, you can believe that if you want, but you're really shortchanging your experience here. I mean, I one of the things that I've understood from my experience is that there is another life beyond this. And then there's another one. And then there's another one. And there's another one. And this goes on forever because the dimension I was in was an eternal dimension. It wasn't, it wasn't the finite linear time and space that we deal with here. Mm -hmm. Now, we, I also understand that we are born to the parents we choose to come into this life to experience it. But each one of us has an internal essence, a spiritual essence, a soul, if you wish. Uh, you can call it anything you want. And that never dies. And that's what goes after we've shed this body. Now, when we come into this dimension from a higher energetic dimension, we basically have to lower our wattage because for our internal essence to experience this dense life, it, it has to come down some levels. It has to obtain a human body because that's the species we are here for it to be able to navigate in in this planet now yeah. you go to an, you go to another dimension yet besides and you may find something completely different and uh that was one of the things i did witness when i was in that other dimension i'll i'll come back to that in in just a minute but so we're, we're here experiencing these things and then when we when our body you know uses up its energy uh and dies our our inner essence doesn't die it takes off and it goes back i liken it uh i use the uh, analogy in my book that in 1951 i got off the energetic superhighway in the other dimension and i zipped down in i was born to my parents and I'm here experiencing this life in a way I could not if I just stayed in the energetic dimension I was in. So I can I can feel, uh, I can laugh, I can cry, I can, you know, do things, I can uh, go places. Uh, we do all the things that humans do. Uh, we get I believe we're given free choice. So the choices we make are. Uh, what we decide we want to do. And some of those choices affect the outcome of how, how we work, our experience this life. But once, once my body has used up all its fuel here and it dies, I'm going to, my inner essence is my soul is going to get back on that super energetic highway and go off to the next experience. 
that doesn't die. That is the real us. Right. And so we we have an eternity to experience things in different places. What could be better than that? I mean, yeah, we, we hate seeing our friends leave or family members leave, but they're having their own journey. So it's really nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, we, we, we feel bad when they die, but it's more because of something we feel we've, we've lost. Not that maybe that's the best thing for them is to take off and go somewhere else. We hold on to things because it pains us, not necessarily for what's good for them. And, you know, I don't know a lot about things medically, biologically, but just a little bit I do know. It's just, you know, we get cut, our body makes a scab, we heal, we break a bone, you know, it heals and all these things. We get a cold, we heal. There's so much that our body does to protect us just naturally that we don't have to do anything, you know, just our, our immune system. And so why wouldn't our bodies create a way for us to live on? Well, it's not, I'm, I'm not sure that it's our bodies that have created that uh, way to move on. I think it's a consequence of the dynamics of this plane of Dimension. But I mean, for, for people that believe in just a, a materialistic, you know, that, oh, there's not possible, we can't live past our our brain, our brains, that's what the scientists say, our brains are dead, we're dead. They say there's no way we can have these memories while our brain is dead, because our brain couldn't store the memories. And I'm like, because it's stored in our soul not in our brain we're outside of our brain outside of our body when we have these memories we're not using our brain when we come back that's our soul remembering is my feeling and then for them to think that's not possible and i think well how is it possible for all the miraculous things our bodies do moment to moment every day that it you know heals itself it self-regulates our temperature or everything how even the universe if it was anything off by one smidgen the whole thing would fall apart you know we have all these miraculous things going on so why wouldn't our soul be miraculous so that's just no, exactly ex no exactly we are the miracle we are the miracle for being here at this point in this time the miracle uh, may be for other people to be at a different point in time but yes, uh, we, we are the miracle. So we, we need to um, honor that. And one of the things I learned uh, from my experience is <clears throat> that we, we need, we come here to acknowledge the divinity in every other person who is alive. Because each one of us has that kernel, that inner essence that was uh, from the source of all creation. You can call it God, you can call it uh, the divine energy, you can call it whatever you want, but it all comes from there. And people can doubt that and that's fine, uh, they, they, as I said, we, we have free will here. We can believe what we want to believe, but that doesn't necessarily make it true at the end that your skepticism or, or cynicism uh, is going to hold because that's not part of the higher dimension. Neither is fear and neither is hate. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to acknowledge that the person next to us, even the one we don't like, is just as divine as you are or I am. It, it's all stemming from the same source, uh, the same God, if you will. Uh, and it's not for us to deny that in another person. Now I haven't I haven't really talked about my uh, actual experience in in another dimension, and um, certainly anyone who's interested can read in the book, or I could give you a short 
uh, description of what what I did experience. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you the truth. People get really upset in the comments when they they don't tell their experience. They say read it in the book. They'll say that's just somebody trying to sell their books. <laughs> I, I can hear it already. I know my audience. Okay. No, that's fine. I've I have tried. I have quite honestly, I've had to learn shameless self promotion. That's not me. I uh, I'm not one to push push my book but I think it has a message for people who are interested. So yes, I will, I will go back and I will explain uh, exactly what I witnessed and recall. So after uh, I collapsed, <clears throat> excuse me, after I collapsed on the floor, which, which obviously I must have done, I don't remember it because the, as I mentioned, the last thing I remember were the tingling of my forearms. And I didn't even know I had died. I found myself sitting on a, the best way I can describe it is a raft. Now, one of the things I've learned is that in that dimension, there is not language. There is no vocabulary, there are no human words. So one of the hardest things for me was to try to find human words and vocabulary that could identify what was happening to me at that point. So that's that's the best approximation of what I can see this as. It was some sort of a raft. And I was floating on these waves. They were coming in from ahead of me. They were going through me. They were going from my head through my feet. And at this point, I realized I had some form of a, a hologram of my body because I looked at my hand and it was made of all these energetic filaments, but it had the shape of hands. That's the best way I can explain it. Uh, I think it was more than that, but for you know, until I'm enlightened as to really what it was, that's the best I can explain to someone else. But these waves would be going through me and they continued on to what we would call the distance. Now, again, in this, this dimension, there is no human linear scale of anything. There's no time, there's no space, there's no up, down, sideways. It's all a big, Amphitheater, if you would, a, a, a gigantic, if you can imagine an amphitheater as big as eternity, that's what it was. There were no walls. I mean, there was no clouds. There was no sky, no stars. Uh, so I sat there, and this is what I recall. I sat there just amazed at, at these waves coming in, and I saw these little rafts all over the place. Uh, dotting the distance again. Um, and finally, I looked up, and there was this gig well, gigantic, a million, million suns of energy that was glowing and pulsing. And these waves were coming out from this. And I realized that that had to be the source of creation. I mean, there was nothing else that it could be. It, call it God, if you will. Call it divine energy. You know, whatever it is, you attribute to the most supreme intelligence. That's what it was. And I'm going to use the word God just because it's it's easier to translate I, that. I use the that, word God. Yeah. It's fine. And God was of no sexual orientation. It wasn't him, her, or it. It was God. <clears throat> so anyway, when I saw that, it was interesting because I could reach, reach out what was my hand and touch it and not get burned. It was that, that close, but yet that immense. And there were 
there were these little little sparks coming out from this huge, gigantic, glowing energy. And not only in front of me, they were going out in all different directions. So I assumed if there's another opposite side of it, if we we're you know going to compare it to a sun, on the other side, they were coming out of there as well. Were they colorful? Took, or was they all white? They were, they, no, they were red. They were reddish streaking out. And I took those to be uh, beings, entities, uh, coming from the source, going out to different dimensions. And I almost forgot to look around. <laughs> I remember uh, I, I actually, I guess I, you would say I chuckled because I thought, well, maybe I should turn around and see what, what's going on behind me. Like you would do here, sitting on a raft on a river. You'd turn around and see what's going on. And all, all I saw was the distance of eternity. That sounds odd, but the farther I looked, the clearer it became. It, it's one of those things where you're not seeing with human eyes. So one of the things I've asked people to do is think of this story as uh, being possible because of all the impossibilities that it presents to you. As I was watching these waves recede into the distance, I started to see all these different dimensions lined up. Uh, the best way I can explain it, and I, I talk about this, is if you take our universe, all we know about the universe we presently reside in here, Earth, you know, this, this universe, and you, you compress it down to maybe uh, the size of a sheet of paper, okay, Stick with me, I'll, I'll get you to this. That it was suspended there. Right next to it was another completely different universe. Next to it was another one, and another one, and another one. As far as you could see into the distance, or as far as I could see into the distance. Now, in our linear description of, of space, we, we talk about directions, up, down, sideways. There were all of these universes suspending in this gigantic amphitheater. I'm thinking zip each, file. <laughs> each, each one of them had a thread back to the source, to God. So everyone was connected to the source of all creation. So we are not alone. We're just in a, 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 a dimension that we exist, but there are other dimensions. And that's why I said before that when I get back on the super, the energetic super highway, I'm gonna find another dimension and uh, experience something there. And, if you think about it, it, it makes sense because we have an eternity to explore all of these different things. I don't, I really do not believe personally, I may be shown differently at some point in the future, but at this point, I don't believe that we're just here for this one experience and then we're stuck somewhere in a corner on a shelf for the rest of eternity. Because eternity exists, whether people want to believe that or not. I mean, we date date this universe to be something like, uh, what, 8 billion years old. Okay, what was before that? Well, there was time as we know it before that. And there will be time after us as we know that. And I'll, I'll bring it even a little closer. If you, if you think about eternity being somewhere beyond us, okay, it also is somewhere previous to us. Um, I use an example of take your fifth great grandparents. At some point, they obviously were alive because you're here. 
uh, at some point, they probably thought about a future without them being alive. That was their eternity. Well, that's us. We are living in their eternity. So in that perspective, we are already an eternal presence. So it's just a matter of how you want to relate to it. Yeah, physically, yeah. Well, of course, our bodies won't be able to maintain an eternal presence because they typically run out, you know, 60, 80 years. And then that's about the functional end of, of the human body. But that's okay, because then we get to go on to something else. And if, if I didn't believe that, I certainly wouldn't say it. So I've, I've learned from all of this that uh, death isn't anything to be afraid of. It, it's just part of what we do here. But once we're dead, we, it releases us to go to another experience. Enjoy it while we're here. You know, do what you can to make it better. But it's not going to last. It hasn't lasted for anybody who, who lived before us. So I think when we accept that fact and understand that, well, we don't die when, when our body dies because our inner essence, our, our divinity, uh, our soul keeps going. And that's great. And it's a gift. I mean, it's a gift to us. It's a gift to us from source. And uh, we can shorten our life here if we choose to, because I don't, I do not believe that the source of all creation or God really tells us what we should be doing. I think we are given a chance to experience many different things here. But I think that when it's all said and done, that whole dimension that I was in was love. Everyone was welcome. In fact, they were expected to be back at some point. Uh, I did not experience what people would refer to as hell. There was no dungeon. There were no uh, gnashing of teeth. Uh, those are all human constructs. And I'm not, I'm not belittling anybody's religious uh, training or experience. It's just not what I experienced. Right. Yeah, it's all what we make of our experience sometimes, what we come back and what we decide. You know, this means that and this means this. And, um, you know, so I can see some people is from maybe they – I feel like have they been reading a lot of new age books or have they been involved with ions a lot or have they have they been exposed to this or that or you know different into ears come back with different takes like some didn't really know what to make their experience until they saw a medium and the medium told them this or that so you know when we come it's like there's the experience uh, I tell people there's the experience like that's the meat on your plate you know and the rest of it is what we make of it how we interpret it because we have to comprehend it we have to put it in some kind of framework to be able to describe it and go on with our daily lives. Well, <clears throat> I've done a lot of research for my books, my other books, uh, agriculture and farming books. And this was part of me and my exercise to understand it was to research as much as I could. And so at that point, uh, I did read other NDEs and look at other afterlife experiences. But I purposely avoided them initially so that I could focus on mine uh, as purely as I could without having an outside influence. And so now I, I'm finding that there are similarities that other people have had uh, to mine. Now, I never, I never once thought that I was unique. Uh, I'm just another human being who inhabits this planet at this moment. And I have a family, but it doesn't make me a, uh, doesn't make me a prophet, um, certainly not a saint. But uh, I do have 
a perspective that I think can be useful and helpful to people who are afraid. Right. And that it's it's really, that's really the message that I want to convey is that you don't have to be afraid there. And there are people you can talk to to help work through some of the things that make one afraid. I mean, there are enough organizations out there that can assist and good ones. Mm -hmm. um, and before, before we do uh, finish this today, I do want to applaud all EMTs and ambulance people and uh, without their help, I wouldn't be here. Right. So it's it's been part partly what I want to get across to people is support your local EMTs, uh, your local ambulance services. Uh, they typically fly under the radar until you need them, and yeah. but they're they they are worthy of your support. So if I can get that message across to them, then I'll be happy. Yeah. Yeah. My last guest, you know, he and I were saying, how could, this is with our doctors, people say, oh, you should sue them because of things that happen, you know, that maybe caused your death. And we're both like, how can you sue someone when you've just received a miracle? And because you received a miracle or, you know, brought back, they were there to, you know, fix you medically. We needed somebody to fix us medically, not just be brought back, but we have to be fixed medically as well. So. They have unique talents. Uh, I'm not sure I could be, be a very good EMT, uh, but they they are trained, and I I I do believe that they are worthy of everyone's support, right? In in whatever form, financially or becoming a part of them. You know, I live in a rural area, and the closest EMT we have is eight miles away. So if it had happened to me out in our pasture, the chances of me surviving were probably pretty slim. First of all, because nobody else knew I was out there. Your wife would have and, found you when she got home from work, wouldn't she? Well, she would have had to come looking for me. Yeah. And then where, where do you look? Um, and an EMT would have to do the same thing if they're out there with an ambulance. They'd have to drive around the field, try to find a body laying out there. And that this is one other thing that I believe I should mention is that for anyone else who's had an NDE, they probably will understand this better than people who haven't. But your spouse, in my case, Mary, um, your children, uh, your caregiver, your partner will have a different perspective of what happened to you than you do. And oftentimes they, they are the last to be attended to or listened to. Um, but their, their support is, is vital. Uh, they may not quite understand what you went through because they only see what happened to you from the outside. While my internal being changed, my thinking changed. The way I look at things changed. And they they only see that all of a sudden I've gone to uh, this person I was before to now to almost being oblivious to stuff because a lot of it didn't make any difference. The stuff I owned was, well, you know, okay. I'm not going to take it with me. I realized that. And so it uh, conversations get got to be a little... Um, different in, in many ways, if there were conversations. But um, my wife was uh, the recipient of all of this angst in a matter of seconds when I collapsed, because all of a sudden she, found, she had to uh, deal with farm work, uh, the finances, uh, talking with her friends, still letting my family, my mother know what happened. Uh, emails to no end. At one point, she placed a stack of six-inch emails that she had printed out of all the people she had been in contact with when I was in the hospital. So it's it's not just the person who experiences the NDE that is affected. And I hope people will, you know, pay a little more attention to 
the other people that are involved because it's like the ripples of a pond when you throw a stone in it goes to a wider circle than what you want to think and uh, I'm grateful for the sport I had uh, it's just just something that uh, I think people should be aware of there's there's more than just your own self taking you all along yeah I've told my husband before you know the ones that help us into ears like that, they're the wind beneath our wings because without that sounding board, like to practice on, to feed this information to, to get that first initial reaction because they could be the ones to shut us down from the get-go and we just clam up and never say another word. But when they listen to us and don't treat us like we're fools or liars or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, then, then we can find our voice and find a way to express it. But it also can be suffocating, I think, in the sense that um, they're afraid to say something because they don't know how, well, in, in my case, how I would take it. Uh, it. It's just a different dynamic, and I think that would be something that needs to be explored by researchers a little bit more as to the ongoing effects of an event like my collapse. Uh, mostly Mary is, I think has gotten over it, but still there are times when I talk to her about something that it's like uh, PTSD. Now I'm not, I'm not equating it to that, but it's kind of like that, is that these, this event dredges up a lot of stuff that happened during the uh, next few days that were really hard for her to handle. Yeah. I don't know, because I yeah, wasn't around it, but right. she's explained right. that to me. You know, like our NDEs, I think are like the reverse, our memories of it are like the reverse of PTSD. You know, it's a strong emotional memory, but we control it. It's not intrusive. It's not upsetting in a harmful way, but I can see that, that for ones that was there when you almost died. And when you're recovering, that that would be a PTSD for them because they didn't have that ex the the heavenly experience. They didn't see the other side. They just had what was going on here on Earth. It was very traumatic. But, yeah, they they all they could see was well, in the case of my wife, her husband lying on a on a stretcher. Uh, in the case of our children coming into the hospital, seeing their dad underneath the white sheet, um, still still alive, but not knowing what the end result would be, whether I'd have my memory back or whether I'd even be functional. So there were a lot of unknowns for them, uh, which again, I was completely oblivious to and didn't find out about until I talked with him much later. So uh, there, it comes back to that it just isn't one person that it happens to. Uh, the other people, uh, people, friends, around, family around you are, are affected as well. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that because it, it, it's an extensive conversation. Yeah. I just wanted to say that, you know, that's important. Anybody that's thinking about doing counseling with people who's had near-death experiences is to include the family. I think that would be a, a good a good route, yeah, because you need a place where people can express themselves and not be chided or, uh, you know, say not nah, that you know doesn't make any difference or, or put down or dismissed. And yeah, it's it would be a, a good option. Now I I don't know how you make that happen, but I, it would be something I hope people. Uh, with wherewithal can can pursue that and make make those kind of uh, counseling sessions available. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about you didn't get to cover or you want to add? Well, um, well, I could talk about the medications I had, but <laughs> it caused me to end up in the hospital a second time. Now I'm not going to blame the the doctors, but it was again the case where 
my wife saw something was not working right. And what, what happened was <clears throat> I started losing my balance. Now, this was uh, three months after I was out of the hospital. And I was put on a blood thinner, which was going to be eliminated after one year because they did not uh, find any added benefit to it after that point. I was put on an aspirin uh, and I was put on a stat. And uh, also they gave me a, a vial of metric glycerin just in case <laughs> I needed it. Uh, never used it. But uh, we narrowed it down to the statins that I was, I was starting to lose my balance. I'd stumble and when I never had that problem before. And that in, eventually eight months later, I ended up back in the hospital because of, I collapsed at our clinic, local hospital's clinic. And through a process of elimination and more tests, uh, that's what they narrowed it down to as well. But they wouldn't listen to my wife when she told them that was the problem. <laughs> so again, the, the dismissal of uh, those close to you was not helpful. I have learned the hard way when you go before doctors, emergency rooms, wherever, don't diagnose yourself because they will be determined to prove you wrong. Just let them, just let them figure it out. Because if like, if, if you ever try to diagnose, it's like, you're trying to tell us our job. Okay. Well, you'll well <laughs> I, I don't, I don't have the medical training. Okay. But I knew something was wrong because I had never, I wasn't stumbling all over the place. It's just every once in a while. And if I bent over and, and uh, rose up really quickly, I'd be really dizzy and just about fall over backwards. I mean, it, it did affect me. Once we eliminated those, uh, about two weeks later, I was fine, you know, until all of that got out of my system. So that was the one med medical aspect. Uh, the first one, you know, having two stents put in to open up the two clogged arteries was, was good. Um, that was a, a, I mean, a really interesting experience. Uh, but again, I wasn't awake when they did them. But I, I told, I, I ended up with a six inch stack of medical reports that I could pour through and understand what they did. I mean, I could understand the physical aspects of it, but it took much longer to fully understand what happened to me during my uh, residence in a different dimension. So uh, from that, uh, I know that there is a transmission between uh, the membrane that separates time and space as we know it to the next dimension. I mean, if I can go back and forth and bring back memories of what I saw there, then that's possible for other people as well. And I think it's also possible, <clears throat> if I can do that as a human, then why couldn't other entities that are not human do the same thing? You know, I'll call them guides or guardians or angels. You can call them what you want, but they're there. The interesting thing that uh, I find now is Initially, I had to close my eyes and I could take myself, transport myself back to that dimension instantly. Now, I don't even have to do, I don't even have to close my eyes because it's right there in front of me. It, it's not that it clouds anything, but it's, it's like the background to everything I see. Uh, that's the best way I can explain it. I, I mean, I can see it behind you. And I can see it behind me in this uh, little picture in front of me. Uh, it doesn't leave. So I know it has to be true in that I have not been deceived and that I am not deceiving myself, which is important because then I'm not deceiving someone else with what I've written. So, yeah. There's, there's a transmission between dimensions that we may not understand here at this point, but we will 
at some point because we're going to leave again. When we die, we're not sticking around. I mean, you leave the shell behind and you go somewhere else. Uh, it's pretty much that simple. And again, I, I hope people believe me. I really don't lose any sleep if they don't because that's their choice. Uh, well, I have a copy like, of your book here and I'll put the link to it in the description. Okay. Well, and thank you. Uh -huh. well, so thank you. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate being able to tell my story. Um, it wasn't necessarily chronological, but it covered a lot of the, the things that I wanted to say. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you, to meet you, and to anyone who's viewing this, uh, don't be afraid. Thank and you. Thank for you. Yeah. Thank you for sending me a copy of your book. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it as well. Okay. All right. I'll get this sent out to you tonight. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh -huh. It's been fun. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.